Hi everyone, I'm Clara Liu. I'm the CEO of Know Your Team, software that helps managers avoid becoming a bad boss. And I have someone who is possibly the most opposite person of a bad boss, uh, who I've admired and respected for, for a very long time. I've got with me today, Nick Francis, who is the CEO and co-founder of Help Scout, an amazing customer support a platform that we actually at Know Your Team use, and we've been customers um, for years, very, very happy customers. Uh, so I originally got to know Nick, obviously, um, in, in him being a wonderful customer, but their company is, is pretty incredible. So entirely remote, um, has over 90 employees serving close to 10,000, if not more than 10,000 customers, <laughs> like by the hour, right? By the end of this this call, it'll be more than that. Um, and uh, I, I'm so excited to chat with you today, Nick, because I followed your writing. I have like a million questions from some blog posts that you've written. Um, so we have no shortage of things to talk about. But the first question I did want to ask you um, is, is around leadership. Actually, before I ask you that, there was actually one other thing I did want to ask you about. We talked about this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, before the call, which is you were uh, sort of hinting to me that there was something really fun that you guys were doing with the company. And so I want to ask you about that. And then we'll get to get to the meat of things. Okay, yeah, no problem. Uh, you may not, you may know this, you may not, but uh, in February, Help Scout became a certified B Corporation. Uh, it's something that we worked on for more than a year and we're really proud of the certification, really part, proud to be part of that uh, community. And as a result of that, we started a program that's in the process. Uh, so in the next month or so, uh, we'll launch it and talk about it. But uh, it's called Help Scout for Good. Uh, and it's a, so there's a number of things that we're going to do under the umbrella of Help Scout for Good. But one of those is that we're doubling our discount for nonprofits uh, to 20%. We're also offering a 20% discount to uh, all B Corps, all certified B Corps. And then uh, finally, we're offering up to 100% uh, discount to certain organizations that support uh, some issues that we care deeply about. Um, huh human rights, the environment, and online security and privacy. So yeah, we're uh, excited about that program and, and I'm trying to tell as many people as possible about it. So Help Scout for Good. Help Scout for Good. You heard it here <laughs> first, everyone. That is really? incredible. I haven't talked to <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I'm actually really honored then. <laughs> yeah, actually, truly first, everyone who's listening to this. Um, that's amazing and so in line with your mission and not to give everything away, I feel like it is um, just from knowing it, you know, so in line with your own personal leadership philosophy. So so let's start around there. So here's here's the one question around leadership that I've been asking folks, Nick, which is what's something or it could be several things, it doesn't have to be one thing um, that you wish you would have learned earlier as a leader? Uh, um, I have to constantly remind myself of all the things that I don't know. <laughs> As an entrepreneur, you have this sort of built-in ego and self-confidence, yeah. and that can be a really positive thing. It's almost necessary for an entrepreneur, but at the same time, it's really important to be really self-aware of all the things that you don't know. Uh, even if you feel like an expert, there's a lot of things that you don't know about the work, about other people, about interacting with other people. And so uh, most definitely I, I try to, the number one thing that I strive for as a yeah. CEO is greater self-awareness on a daily hmm. basis. I think that's the most important thing for me to just sort of keep my ego in check and to really focus on leveraging it for a lot of the good things uh, that it can do uh, for our company. And so that's certainly something that I think about a lot. Yeah, I... Um... I love that just because I think, well, it's so interesting, you know, you, you ask academic scholars about leadership uh, to define what makes a good leader, and there's this wonderful <laughs> quote about how uh, there are about as many definitions of leadership and of good leadership as there are people who have tried to define it. So the point being, it's kind of all over the place. However, I will say the most consistent thread that I've heard around the definition of good leadership is actually what you described. So uh, this ability to see things for what they are instead of what they, what you would like them to be, the ability to not put your own self-interest first, but you know this group of individuals who you're 
sort of representing, right? I'm wondering when in your journey, whether it was as CEO of Help Scout or maybe it was earlier, did you realize this? Because I don't think it is an obvious insight until you are in the role. Do you remember if there was a specific time or was there a series of events? There's probably a series of events. Um, yeah. I, I can talk about a few of them. Uh, one, we've just, we've brought on some, well, before I get to, get to the good one, uh, <laughs> In the first two years of the company, most people don't know this, but in the first two years of the company, we fired 40% of the people we hired. It was huh. a complete circus. <laughs> we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, yeah. And the three founders, myself included, had never hired anybody before when we started this company. Uh, we knew how to build stuff. We knew how to make stuff, but we didn't mm -hmm. really know how to build a team, much less a, a remote team with a specific culture and ethos uh, that we had in mind. And so we made a bunch of mistakes along those lines. And there's nothing like failure to bring about self-awareness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one. Yep. I mean, uh, but we did finally figure out how to hire uh, great people that, that uh, aligned with our ethos and made our company even better. And there's particular people in my sphere. Uh, one that comes to mind is Becca. She runs People Ops mm -hmm. for yeah. our team. And she has been a constant source of not only compassion and friendship, but of accountability yeah. with regard to interpersonal relationships on the team, how I'm conducting myself, uh, facing my demons, which which she's <laughs> made me well aware of. She uh, calls you out, huh? People. Yeah, so you really need a, a source of accountability within the company. I'm not talking about a board level accountability. I'm not talking about customer level accountability. Right. I'm talking about people in the company that can really uh, call you out and challenge you to, to be the best version of yourself. That's invaluable, I think. And so rare. And I think, well, let me ask. Don't tell Nick she's invaluable, though. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, we'll just, <laughs> just we, <joking>. yeah. <laughs> we won't make that public. Um, <laughs> do you say, like, I mean, I want to go back to this, I mean, you know, in beginning years of the company, firing 40% of the company. I'm like, oh, man, that is hard. Um, it's hard. Do you, so I, I, I'm wondering what, you know, what things you now think about in terms of hiring. And then also it's sort of a two-part question, you know, to this point about accountability within the company. Is that something you actually actively look for and hire for? Or was that sort of unintentional? And then you realized, oh, this is now really important. We should hire for this. Um, so kind of both things, like lessons learned around hiring, best practice, especially as a remote company. I know you've written about this. You have a wonderful post. I think it was back in 2016 where you wrote about the differences of hiring between remote and in-person. That's phenomenal. And I highly recommend folks to check that out on the Help Scout blog, I believe. Um, but yeah, ju just want to hear sort of pick your brain around around hiring in particular. Yeah. So one of the important things about building a remote culture is that you do have to be able to do the work with a certain level of autonomy and and, yep. um, and skill. So one of the big mistakes that we sort of made early on is hiring people that weren't, uh, I hate saying junior or senior level, but they, they, they hadn't been doing the craft for a very long time, right? They were maybe right out of school or they were just figuring out what they wanted to do in their career. They were just in a different place. And I found that in remote, you really want to, First of all, hire and recruit people that are in love with the work. Uh, mm. Culture is a big piece of it, but they really need to love the work. And they need to be able to accomplish a lot. If they're sitting in a room by themselves for an eight-hour day, they still <laughs> yeah. need to be able to get a lot done. And I'm not saying that's how it is at Help Scout. I spend a lot of my time, most of my time, talking with people as, as you and I are talking now. Yep. But still, you want people to be capable of doing great things in a self-sufficient way. And so I think I think a lot of companies would say that they want that, but it you you have to dial that up in a remote culture. Hmm. It's a requirement. It's not Absolutely. something that you hope for. Uh, a culture of mentorship is really difficult to execute against in a remote culture. We sort of we sort of waved the white flag on that one and decided that's not our culture. Our yeah. culture is one in which we want to hire the highest performers, people that are better than us, to make the company better. 
And that that's just that's a different thing to look for. And so I can talk about some of the tactics and the ways sure. that we've that we look for that in the hiring yeah. process and we fix some of the mistakes. But generally, you just want to look for a different profile based on the remote nature of our culture. Absolutely. I, you are definitely not the only person and CEO to say that, you know, of a, a quite a large remote team. So I think about, you know, I, I interviewed Wade Foster from from Zapier and, you know, yeah, you know, Joel uh, Gascoigne. Yeah, from from Buffer. And they very similarly, yeah. actually, very honestly described. And actually, for us, you know, we're a very, very small remote company. And, and, you know, we kind of have the double challenge of, OK, you have to be we're really small and we're remote. So we we can unfortunately afford to hire one who's quote unquote junior, whatever that means. Right. But what it really means to your point is just someone who's just had some time and experience working on their own and actually working on the work itself. And what they both admitted to me, I actually remember Wade in particular, that he hasn't quite figured out yet. And I wonder if you would agree with this, is that unfortunately it means that it's actually really higher to hire for potential, which some kind, sometimes can be like a wonderful surprise. It also means... Um, you know, you can't grow people maybe as naturally or as organically as in an in-person company. I, would you argue with that? Like, would you say you've sort of put some things in place at HelpScout to try to account for that? Or are, just curious to get your opinion on on that that side of things. Yeah, Wade's totally right. Joel's totally right. We we talk about these things, the three of us yeah. all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, I'm sure. And uh, I really admire what both of those uh, CEOs are doing, and and yeah, it, Wade's totally right. You, you can't really it's it's really difficult to hire for potential, especially in a remote culture, because to some extent, eventually, no matter how much onboarding you go through, you're going to get kind of thrown into the deep end, and we're going to ask you to swim, and that's really hard to avoid as a remote culture. And so I've j I've just found that uh, one way to test for that in the hiring mm -hmm. process yep. is is using projects. So one thing about that's just different about hiring. So uh, I spent six years in Boston before I moved to Boulder. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those six years in Boston, I saw most of the companies there are co-located. And I saw what how different their hiring process is. It can take, you know, you go from beginning to end, offer letter, 10 days, yep. right? Yep. Uh, sometimes even, even shorter. I mean, people move really so fast, fast to hire yep. people in a co-located culture. Whereas yep. in a remote culture... Our average time to hire is between 30 and 40 days. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. We really get yep. to know the person. And, and I think that actually helps both sides. Uh, we talk with a lot of people that we interview, whether it worked out or not, about the hiring process just to get feedback. And they really like the fact that they're able to get to know some folks. They're able to work remotely a little bit by way of doing a project. And so we do give everybody a project. It takes anywhere from four to eight hours, depending on the role that we're hiring for and some other variables. And we actually just work with them. We give them feedback. We might do a couple of rounds going hmm. back and forth. But it's really important that they not only be able to talk well about themselves, but they be able to execute on work that, that we give them. And so that's one way you can solve that potential challenge that, that Wade talks about. And by way of having 30 to 40 days to work through that process with a candidate, it, it just kind of frees you up. To, to really go deep and determine whether it's a fit on both sides. Absolutely. And I don't think that that advice is actually unique to remote companies. You know, I think there's, yeah, that, that, uh, <laughs> what you learn, I mean, even in uh, in in working with someone for first, you know, four to four to eight hours, uh, it's incredible. A lot of the, um, a lot of the times when, um, you know, we actually, I mean, we're in the process right now of hiring and, you know, one of the, um, the, the candidates, you know, we've worked with actually for the past few months and it's like that in, in itself, it's kind of the best reference call slash resume you'll ever need. Like that's just the proof in itself. So I think right. for folks, yeah, who are watching this and listening this to whether you, or not you run a remote team, um, to take that to heart. So speaking of a remote team, and you've written extensively on this topic, um, Nick. I, you know, I know it's so sort of. Um, I don't want to say it's cliche, but it's popular right now to talk about like, oh, best practices in a remote team. Obviously, very important, and, and we can talk about that. Except the first thing I want to talk about is actually something a little bit counterintuitive that you published, I think, earlier this year about working in a remote team and I believe the phrase I wrote it down you said overdoing asynchronous communication so 
Yeah, and I want to dig into this because I was like, oh, this is so interesting. All right, so for those of you who are remote leaders who are watching this or work in a remote company, you know that sort of the tendency is you have two forms of communication, communicating sort of in person, rapid fire in Slack or Basecamp or whatever, all the time, chat back and forth, or there's asynchronous, right? Long form, you do it on your own time. And most, co most companies tend to default towards synchronous, right? And so it was interesting, your post talked about going too far on the asynchronous side and actually how that was harmful too. So tell, tell me a little bit about this, <laughs> like what, what was going on? Yeah, the difference between co-located cultures and remote cultures is, is the way I like to describe it is it's just a series of trade-offs, uh, mm, yeah. both, both of which can be really successful, but it's, there's a series of trade-offs. For instance, uh, co-located culture, synchronous communication is, is the default, whereas asynchronous communication is more the default in a remote company. Yes. It's not intuitive to be like, oh, let me call up my teammate and have a video chat with them about something. You actually have to think about it, whereas it, it may be more intuitive to shoot them a chat, a message, email, or whatever. And so um, it's really important to understand a number of those trade-offs, just eyes wide open, going in, knowing what you're going to have to optimize for. Yep. And so yep. when the default yep. is asynchronous communication and your team intuitively works that way, it, you can most definitely go too far with that. And and I had noticed a trend over the last year or so is when I started to, to understand, but hmm. it took us longer to solve hard problems because we were back and forth doing comment threads in a doc or something like that. And I, I actually picked up on, at one of our retreats, hmm. I saw yeah. two engineers around yeah. the table and they had solved an issue in a matter of two or three hours that had really been plaguing them for a number of weeks. And oh, I just found so that, wow, like that's really magic when, and look, video gives you 98% the fidelity that yeah. you get sitting around a table and so, uh, that's one example, but I could give you a number of examples where if as a team we can just coach everybody to lean into face-to-face -to -face communication, that high-fidelity synchronous communication, I know it's a little counterintuitive in a remote culture, but you can just move faster. You can mm – -hmm. uh, I almost said the word synergize, but you can <laughs> – you, know, you, yeah. you can really uh, build a relationship face-to-face -face yeah. in a way that – not possible in Slack or email or anything like that. And so mm -hmm. uh, I've just, relationship building is such an important thing that you have to over optimize yeah. for in a remote culture. Yeah. So face, you know, leaning into to a lot of the face-to-face -face synchronous stuff is just important. And I, I don't think enough remote companies talk about that aspect of it. They just assume the entire business runs asynchronously. So at least yes. in our case, we've we found that maybe 20% of the time, conducting yourself in like actual meetings and face-to-face -face video chats and mm -hmm. stuff uh, is, a, is a really productive way of working. Yeah, I, I so appreciate the nuance. I mean, I think that's what I found so refreshing about the piece is that it wasn't, I mean, I just think it's so easy to, and you, and you sort of see it in kind of the, the blog posts and tweets and things that, you know, come out around remote work. It's so easy to be dogmatic about like, oh, we play for remote teams or we play on the co-located team. And it's just like, well, like you said, it's a series of trade-offs. One is not right or another. And you have to sort of operate a, across a, a sliding scale instead of saying, oh, it's, we have to go 100% on asynchronous or we have to go 100% on synchronous. So I think that's that's a, such a good, important insight. Um, One of the I, teams yeah. feel like we're like, it feels like sacrilege to be like, oh, face-to-face -face <laughs> communication is actually pretty awesome and getting around <laughs> the table to work through a problem yes. can be really helpful. It, it almost feels like, we're breaking some unwritten rule of remote culture that we're not supposed to talk about. It's like, no, I just, I think it's great. And we've got great tools these days that we can leverage to have face-to-face -face communication all over the planet. So why don't we talk about it more? That's all. Right, right. And, and agree that there's some sort of mix, right? So in terms of sort of Help Scouts culture as a whole, I know it's something that you, you know, you think a lot intentionally about, you write a lot intentionally about. What do you think has been, um, I don't know, the real cornerstone you think in, in helping the culture be what it is today? Like, can you sort of, as you reflect on Help Scouts journey and go, gosh, I'm so glad we did 
A. Like if there's any, like we could have done a lot of other things wrong or like done a lot of things different, but as long as we did A or B or whatever that, you know, a few things are that really you feel like helped solidify Help Scouts culture or continues to. I'm curious what that might be. You know, there's a there's a shift early on in a company when you go from founders working in a room together to founders also working alongside people that mm-hmm. you hire to then the people that you hire hiring people to be part of your team. <laughs> and at some point, you have to codify what your values are because the founders aren't hiring everybody. Yep. Uh, and there was a point maybe two or three years into the company where – I think it was Becca, who we've already talked about. She yeah. uh, did this research project where she asked everybody on the team. She interviewed everybody on the team about like what makes Help Scout really great, what's important to them about the culture, and just did this this big values exercise where we we actually wanted to codify our values. And she didn't interview the founders. She interviewed all the team members we had at the time, and picked up on a bunch of phrases and keywords that seemed to be sort of a trend and then kind of sent us a document and we decided on what our core values would be very thoughtfully and very intentionally and it's important to note that they were informed by not us but our team the team that we had crafted up to that point and by way of writing Hmm. down the values and talking about them in a way where it became part of our vocabulary and part of our ongoing we didn't put up posters in the office or anything. We just started to talk about them more often. And by way of doing that, I think it really manifested the ethos that we wanted to, to see the company have. And it was way beyond what the founders were capable of building themselves. I mean, yeah, I talk a lot about hiring people that are better than us. Uh, sometimes that, that can rub people the wrong way. But I think the three of us founders most definitely agree that we've hired a bunch of people that are much better than us at various things. And that certainly applies to the values and the ethos. I would love to to mm. say that I'm as pure and as um, sort of untainted as the Help Scout values, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> my you're fallible, Nick? I, what? You make right, mistakes? My, what? Yeah, I you have flaws? flaws. I make mistakes. Yeah, but oh the God. way that we talk about Help Scout and the way that we – you know, to some extent, really uh, set ourselves up for a much higher level of critique publicly. Yeah, uh, it's those values that then mm. inform that brand, and we're happy to hold ourselves to a super high standard in that regard. And that's way beyond what we could have initially uh, kind of done or manifested in the company as founders. And so, just uh, finding a way to codify those values was a really important turning point for us. Absolutely, I think. Um... I think that's such an interesting response because I think, um, you know, maybe for people who are listening to this, Nick, they might be like, oh, yeah, you know, somewhat obvious, maybe, right, maybe. But I think your approach was actually quite, quite unique in that it wasn't you sort of leading a brainstorm session. It wasn't like a piece of paper that was sort of put forward saying here, you know, here are like the list of the 10 words, like, you know, choose six, right? It was you weren't even involved in the process. Um, And... Uh, talk about actually maybe being a little nerve wracking. I can only imagine as someone starting the company and then being like, okay, now I'm having all these other people sort of define the heart and soul of it. Yeah. I don't know if you felt that. It didn't that. seem very necessary to me. I was like, do we really need to write, are we going to be that company, right? That, that oh, down interesting. Their core values and <laughs> sings Kumbaya and gets us in a yeah. circle and hold. But yeah. Uh, it was totally led by Becca, and she was she was right on with her instincts and mm. in wanting to mm. to write them down at that point. So you're totally right. The fact that it wasn't really led by us, the fact that it was somewhat of a nuisance initially, made made the process that much more organic and and productive. Totally. Well, and I think also for a lot of leaders, you know, you're like, when do we have the time to do that? You know, or like on the list of priority, like where does this fit in with sort of product strategy and hiring and recruiting? And it's like, oh, we're going to do a values exercise, really? Um, but I think, uh, well, I mean, what would you say for, for to a leader right now? Like, let's say who's sitting across from me, he's like, I don't know, Nick, like a little skeptical. Like, if, is that really it? <laughs> well, I, I did just something popped into my head, which was a yeah. really big room learning that nobody's talked about, um, which is that early on in the company, we really over-invested in what we call people ops. 
uh, it, formerly known as HR, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, but we we really invested heavily into the people ops function, and we have that to thank for codifying our values, but a bunch of other things as well. I, I believe when we were 17, 18 people, we had three in people ops. <laughs> uh, that, that is were, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, cultivating this culture and this ethos. And not only that, but setting us up uh, to uh, do proactive recruiting of uh, mm. candidates that would help us even out the hiring pool with underrepresented groups. And so by awesome. over-investing, you know, on paper, that would never make any sense. There's not a CEO on the planet that would see three people, ops people of 18 and think that's a good idea. Yes. But in a remote culture, and it just sort of turned out that way. We hired a couple huh. people that ended up just gravitating towards that field. Yeah. Uh, but that became such a critical uh, thing for us in order hmm. to uh, sustain these values and build this culture that everybody's pretty proud of now. Uh, early on, especially if your team is remote, I think when you're remote, you have to solve a lot of scaling challenges way before co-located companies have to solve them. And that was one of them, just getting the culture and hiring process and all of these things dialed because they're all a reflection of the brand. Right. And that's our most, that's our most valuable asset. And so when it comes to codifying values or figuring out your hiring process, figuring out how to, how to make remote work, all of that revolves around a people ops function, which if you over-invest in early on, I think you would look back in hindsight and never, ever regret it. Hmm. It's counterintuitive, really. I, I think yeah. so, like, well, I was like- wants to invest in the product, right? Like, right. build sales, marketing, totally. uh, product, people, but it's totally. not just about that. Well. It depends on the kind of business you're building, but we sure. want to build a business that is still going to be able to sustain itself for the long term. And so you have to get the fundamentals right. Uh, product comes and goes, you know. Right. And well, and what influences product? It's people. It's right. the environment they're working on. It's on how well people are communicating. It's on if they feel valued. Um I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, oh, wow, like that's, that's something I'm definitely taking away from this conversation because I, I, I think I similar, I would have heard those numbers when you were that size and I would have been like, really, really interesting. Yeah. So it's amazing. Well, I mean, it, it explains a lot to be frank about, you know, now knowing and seeing the success of your company and, and, and firsthand, you know, knowing the kind of culture that you have. Sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah. The reason we decided to build a remote culture was all about talent. Uh, so selfishly, it wasn't that I wanted to live all over the world and uh, be a, a journeyman. It wasn't it wasn't anything about my own quality of life. It was frankly that I felt like we needed to have uh, a better team, a more talented group of individuals as part of our company in order to survive in a really crowded market. We're we're in the the world's largest software market, CRM. It's, yes, uh, you are. Going- Lots of competitors, and yes. in order to, to gain some sort of advantage, I felt like talent was going to be critical for us. And so, uh, if you want to if you want to hire great people and that that really do make the company better, it does start with the company and the culture that they're working for. And so, again, with over investing in people ops, I just feel like we were setting a foundation upon which we could build a, a remote sort of brand that. You know, my goal was always to be in the top five companies that somebody thought of when they're ready to get a remote job. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we were there, I felt like we would be exposed to a level of talent that would that would help us stand out in the market. Mm, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah, just to tie it back to revenue, I'm not all yeah. kumbaya. We want to build a great business. My God, I I no. I mean, I I don't know. The kumbaya is good too because I I think you know you I don't know. I think, you know, we, and I'll speak for myself, like, you know, I got into this world to build a business, yes, to make a ton of money, yes, to help a lot of people, and then obviously to, as well, build a place, like you said, that, you know, people want to work at, and there's a a feeling of definitely satisfaction and reward that comes with it, so, you know, if you can, if you can kind of scoop it all and cover it all, that's, that is the goal. Um, So, so Nick, you, you took a sabbatical recently. I did. Yeah, I took a month off for the first yes. time in eight years. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It was, it was really great. I loved uh, the piece that you wrote about it. 
It was so interesting. I mean, so let's, I would love for you to share with folks, yeah, who are tuning in, going into this, sort of, why'd you take it? How are you feeling? Were you sort of nervous? Was this like a reluctant sabbatical? Or were you just sort of like running into it like, yes, I need this after eight years? Yeah, so uh, I can count the number. So I take vacations and stuff, but I always typically work a couple hours a day on vacation just to kind of keep up with things. Sure. Uh, I, I've been a dependency for a really long time in a number of areas of the business, so I felt like even when I go on vacation, I'm going to have to – so I can count on my on one hand the number of days I've spent completely off-grid at Help Scout, at least pre-sabbatical. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got to the point where I felt like – that was no longer healthy for the business for me to be glue in so many areas um, and for, for the company to sort of uh, struggle without my input or um, mm. without me adding some sort of value to the equation. And so uh, I, I also sensed that, you know, I've rewritten my job description a couple of times at Help Scout and I, I sensed that in order for me to continue in the role and continue to justify myself being in the role, it was important for me to write a new job description. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is Nick, this is actually Nick 4.0. I'm not sure if you can tell. It's <laughs> Nick 4.0. At least in Help Scout context. Noted. Uh, and so, yeah, there were a bunch of reasons why it just felt like, look, I was I was a bit burned. Like I would, I, sure. I love the work. Yeah. I was re- I got to the point where I was really looking forward to taking a little bit of time off, but totally. I felt like it was going to be even better for the company in some way, and I wasn't quite sure how. Yeah. So one, I knew that I knew going in like three or four months in advance, so I was able to make a big list of things that felt like dependencies that I wanted to get off my plate before I left. So that yeah. exercise in itself was extraordinarily productive huh. yeah. in a number of ways. Yep. But then I took the month off and not only was it great personally, I got to, I've been married for 13 years. I got to really reconnect with mm, my wife. Amazing. Now she really loves sabbatical Nick way more than <laughs> work Nick yeah. and asks for him to come back on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> but we had a great time, uh, but also the company was able to, you know, over the course of a month, your company is going to sol- make some really big decisions and solve some really complex problems if you're doing it right. And it was really great to see the company and the people in the company just kind of step into those roles and make stuff happen, make some really great decisions along the way. And um, as I came back, it was so much easier to, instead of kind of go right back into the old glue role that I had, it was so much easier to say, okay, well, the company is able to function without me in all of these areas. Mm -hmm. Maybe one area Mm -hmm. where okay, I, I want to, I want to improve that area. I don't feel like the company was uh, optimal in this one area, maybe because I was gone. So I want to, I want to fix that hole. But otherwise, uh, I, I just felt the freedom to sort of redefine my role and, and determine where I felt like I could add value and where the company needed me to add value in the next several years. And just such a great way to, to come back and, and look at the company from a 60,000 foot view. And uh, now it's great to see my friend Joel and all the folks at Buffer just did a sabbatical yeah. program. Yeah, Hopefully that. it's catching on. It's great. Yeah, well, it, I think, um, uh, well, I know Basecamp, you know, who uh, obviously, you know, spun yeah, you know, your team. before us. Right, and, uh, you know, the founders are on our board. I know that they have employees I want to say it's every three-year anniversary that they have an employee. They take a month off, something like that, for every three years you work. Something like that. Um, But I think the thing that I found interesting um, was you're the CEO. It's different. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. It's It's different. I'm semi-ashamed to say, but, like, aren't all ideas originally base camp ideas? Most of them. (laughs) So the Jason and DHH do a great job with, with all things remote and, and, and culture. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we probably did borrow that idea from, from them and it wasn't oh, the first. Well, no, no, no. But uh, I mean, I guess what but, I'm astounded by is, yeah, like it's not just anyone taking it. Like I actually don't know if Jason and I actually should ask them. I don't know if Jason and David have ever taken a sabbatical. Honestly. Yeah, it'd be a good question. I mean, David, uh, maybe. I don't know about Jason. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe when he had his kid, I'm not sure. But I, I just think that is this, like, it's different, I think, not saying that employees are more replaceable or anything. I just mean that mm-hmm. when you founded a company and you're the CEO, like, a month off, like. Yeah, well, it's. It's unconventional, you know, the, yeah. 
the real measure of a good leader is is uh, what happens when you're not around. I mean, right. uh, any any manager, uh, you're not supposed to be in the weeds with people. You're supposed to free yep. up your people to do their best work. So uh, while it may be harder for a somebody that's uh, an individual contributor, somebody that has their hands around the work all the time. Yep. Uh, for a manager, like your job is to make yourself useless, right? If you're super busy as a yes. manager and you're in the weeds as a manager, you're probably not doing it right. Right. <laughs> to some extent, you need Absolutely. you need to, there's challenges you have to fix, and so I thought it was really important for me not only to set an example because we did have we started the sabbatical program. Hmm. Uh, yeah. It was every it was every five years. We've already moved it down to every four, mm-hmm. um, but it. I just felt like it was important for at least one of the founders to to go ahead and and take the time off to make sh- to 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 reinforce the fact that hey we're serious about this and uh, <laughs> you should really take the time once you've been at Help Scout for a while. Absolutely, I think it's, it's something I think as, as CEOs and as founders and managers that we don't realize is like whatever policy or idea that you suggest and you want other people to do doesn't really mean anything unless you're doing it yourself. <laughs> like it really does. It just never yeah. really gets the traction you want until you're like, okay, 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 I, I will do it. Uh, so I think yeah, what so an sure. yeah, what an incredible uh, what an incredible example. Um, Nick, thank you so much for your time. Like, I literally could talk to you. I mean, we could just chat for, for hours. Uh, so to respect your time, we won't be doing that. But <laughs> I do want to ask you one last question here. Um, circling back to the very first thing you talked about around what you felt like you learned the most um, in, in uh, being a leader, which is uh, sort of <laughs> increasing self-awareness and... Um, putting, putting ego aside, how does one do this? Is my question. How do you, how do you try to actively or maybe just, or surprisingly, uh, find ways to, to increase your self-awareness? Um, these days I'm really lucky. Uh, I have a, a coach, uh, that I work with awesome. and I hang out with her. I used to hang out with her twice a month. Now it's just once a month, but uh, I've gotten to the point where I do know my demons really well, and I know some of my character flaws really well, and she's a source of ongoing accountability uh, with me. So, you know, discovering those things, it's shocking to me how many people aren't interested in discovering their demons, <laughs> right, or character flaws, uh, depending on how you want to refer to sure. them. I, I refer to them as demons because huh. I like really... Uh, it personifies I really, I like, it a like, bit more. Yeah, I like the negative connotation because understanding yeah. those means that you can have a better grasp of them. Um, and by but, the way, I'm actually I'm actually not shocked that people don't want to know about them. Isn't it right? Yeah. Like our our human tendency. I think it's just because you you know you have really good intentions, but I think for most people, the default is actually like, oh, it's the last thing I want to think about. Well, I think that uh, it's important for people to know that everyone has them right? Uh, yep. Everyone that breathes air, the way I look at it is that everybody has a, a character that's made up of several different uh, traits. Okay. And those traits can have really positive sides to them. And those the same trait can also have a, a negative <laughs> side to it. So I get ego as one of those where like, it gives me the confidence to be an entrepreneur and still be able to sleep at night. But at the same time, it can take up all the oxygen in the room and prevent others from adding value if I'm not careful and ego can so I always just think of the negative side of a character trait as mm-hmm. as the demon side right so I'm a I'm a passionate guy I love to talk in a certain way uh, and I love to have an, an opinion but that also manifests itself as anger sometimes mm. and I have to be really careful about that so once you realize hey this isn't I don't have demons because I'm a I'm a bad person. It's actually something that everyone has, and so by way of discovering them, I can have better control of who I am uh, and the person that I want to be. And I don't, I don't know that gives that gives me a bit of comfort. It's it's not that I'm messed up. It's not that I have to uh, feel bad about it. It's right. just that understanding my character is a really key part of being the person that my wife wants me to be, my co-founders totally. want me to be that I work with want me to be and it just feels like it's my responsibility to to understand that a little bit better. Hmm. 
I think you do something really wonderful in your explanation of that, which is one, you're calling them demons, yes, because it, it kind of personifies it, you know, makes it negative, like gives you something to look at. But what I think that actually does is it removes the sense of, like you were saying, sense of self-worth and identification with what that sort of ill aspect of yourself is. I think, you know, a lot of times we don't want to f- look at that reflection in the mirror because we go, oh, this means that I'm not a good entrepreneur. This means I'm a terrible human. This means I'm not worthy of love, like whatever those things are. And I remember I interviewed uh, this wonderful entrepreneur. Her name's Desiree Vargas Wrigley. She runs this great company called Parachute. And she talked about, you know, her biggest lesson that she learned was removing that sense of identity from the ups and downs of the business and from those personal characteristics. But I think what you're talking about too is, is, or what you're talking about, I mean, even more specifically is like, um, is, I mean, weakness, right? And flaw and like really just saying, well, that's not, that's actually, you know, that doesn't make me a bad person. It just makes me a person. Yeah, we all have. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So I, I, it, I don't see how I would sleep at night if I really thought I was a bad person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's just important to know that, hey, and by the way, if you know some of your negative character traits, then think about what's on the opposite side of those. How can I leverage that for good in other people's lives and in the world at large because every character trait in my opinion has a, a really positive aspect and a, and a negative aspect it, it all depends on how you use it absolutely completely agree well nick thank you so much for all the insights you shared and uh yeah for for joining us today so appreciate it my pleasure always good to hang out with you awesome